Amen. Okay, so we have been in this section of Daniel where the first uh, six chapters, he's dealing with interpretation of dreams that were not his own, but now we're looking at dreams and visions that God has given Daniel. And they are similar to what he has been uh, sharing with us thus far. The image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the plain described the empires that would rise and fall in the history of man. The first empire, that head of gold, was the Babylonian Empire. The second empire with the chest and arms of silver, that was the Medo-Persian Empire. The third one, the belly and the thighs of bronze, that would have been the Grecian Empire. And then lastly, the legs of iron and feet and toes, partly iron, partly clay, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire would go all the way until the time of the end. And that final empire would be destroyed by God himself and the leader of that empire. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. As we looked at chapter 7, when Daniel had that vision, it was at the first year of Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar in his reign, around 593 B.C. And so when he had that vision, Daniel himself had a vision of four beasts, remember? And the first one was likened unto... A lion, a winged lion, remember? But it had a man's heart, and, and that was corresponding with the image. Uh, the head of gold was Babylon, so the lion represented Babylon. Babylon, the second beast that he saw in chapter 7 was a bear, a bear riding up on its side and had three ribs in its mouth, right? And that bear represented that, that kingdom that was represented by the image, the chest and arms of silver, which was the Medo-Persian, the Medo-Persian and the third beast was a winged leopard, leopard. And it had how many wings? How many heads? Four, four heads, four wings representing the Grecian empire. But the last beast that he saw in his image, dreadful, fearful, it was a monstrosity. It was worse than anything had ever been saw. There was a, he wasn't an animal alive that could be dis describing this particular beast so fearsome, so awesome, so destructive in his power and his bloodlust. And that was the fourth beast that he saw. And then he saw coming up out of that four, fourth beast a little horn, remember? Go back to chapter 7 for a moment because we're going to talk a lot about that little horn that he saw. In chapter 7, verse 8, I was considering the horns, the horns on this fourth dreadful beast. Well, let's just describe the beast. Here we go, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. The ten horns are ten leaders of ten kings. We read, we read that in the interpretation further on in the chapter. But I was considering the horns, verse 8, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, who is that? That's the Antichrist, of course, the Antichrist. And so then he goes on to talk about the Ancient of Days, but he saw God in his sovereignty sit upon the throne. The court was seated. God sat upon the throne, and God judged this fourth empire. God judged this beast who would control that empire. We looked at that in chapter 7 of Revelation, who that was. We'll probably go back there again tonight. But now as we move into chapter 8, he's going to give us a little more description into the Medo-Persian Empire, into the Grecian Empire, and, and, and then into this man of sin, this little horn, as it were. So chapter 8, this is the second vision that Daniel has that he's going to describe. Uh, he said, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. So the first one was the vision in chapter 7, which happened in 553 B.C. This particular vision happens in 551 B.C. He's going to give you a period of what is taking place in what we call the times of the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles, for your remembrance, to review with you, begins with the Babylonian Empire and their conquest of Israel, and it goes all the way until the end of the tribulation, the times of the Gentiles, where God will establish Israel as a nation among the nations once again, and he'll be reigning in Jerusalem, governing over his people. But here, nonetheless, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, it, and it... 
so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. So uh, Shushan was the capital of the Medo-Persian Empire. So he's at the capital, and he sees this vision that's taking place. This is uh, 100 years uh, after the Esther-Nehemiah story. But he says, I lifted up my eyes, and I saw there standing beside the river a ram, 100 years in the future, a ram which had two horns. The two horns were high, but one was higher than the other horn. And the higher one came up last. Now, we don't have to wonder what this is because he's going to explain all of this to us, what this ram was. And if you look at verse 20, it says, The ram which I saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. So why two horns and one, why was one higher than the other? Because it represented the two kingdoms, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians. But why was one higher than the other? Because the Persian Empire was stronger and greater and came up afterwards. That's what he's talking about there. So I, verse 4 now, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no beast could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. This was the Medo-Persian Empire and their conquest of that part of the known world at that time. What followed the Medo-Persian Empire or that, that uh, uh, chest of, of silver and arms of silver or that bear that was uh, uh, raised up on its side, what followed this? The Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire represented by the winged leopard, by the four heads, four wings, and the leopard was a, a beast of tremendous speed. So now, and it's described here as a goat. Um, and as I was considering, suddenly, a male goat from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So, so as he's seeing this ram, this ram who had two horns, and one horn was more notable, was higher than the other, the Middle Persian Empire. Now he sees this goat come out of the west, and this goat has a single horn, and this goat is going to charge the ram, and this, it's uh, traveling at such an accelerated rate of speed, like the woman who hit our building went airborne, this goat wasn't even touching the ground. <laughs> he's moving so fast. And he came, verse 6, to the ram. Oh, we'll go back to verse 5 for a minute. And not without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. One single horn. Now, what did that represent, that horn of the Grecian Empire? Alexander, Alexander the Great. That's right. And we're going to, it's going to explain that to us in verse 21. But this is Alexander the Great. Verse 6. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river. And he ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. But there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one who could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. So what is that describing now? The fall of Alexander. The fall of Alexander. What, how old was Alexander when he died? Do you know? 33 years old. Can you imagine that? He conquered the entire world at 33. And he did it with such speed and ferocity. Amazing. But then there, there was nothing else for him to conquer. and He began to drink to excess and not take care of himself, and he died at 33 years old. Now, after he died, his kingdom was divided. He didn't have any offspring. He didn't, his kingdom was divided by his four generals, remember? And that's the four horns that are represented here. As the leopard has four heads and four wings, representing these four generals who would control the empire that Alexander had conquered. Uh, Cassandra was in Europe, Macedonia and Greece. Uh, Lysimachus, he was in Asia Minor, which, we, which is Turkey today. And then you had the Ptolemy, General Ptolemy, who had Egypt and North Africa. Now, the most significant aspect of this would be the Seleucids, under, uh, which is in Asia and in the east. It would be Syria, Israel, Mesopotamia. Someone is going to rise from there who's going to be a type of the Antichrist to come. So there's a near fulfillment and there's a far fulfillment of this, this little horn or this man. Who would that be, this near fulfillment? 
Antiochus Epiphanes, that's right. He's a Seleucid uh, leader who comes from that, that descendancy of that general who took over that portion. And that's who he's going to be describing now in verse 9, the little horn. Now, it goes way beyond Antiochus Epiphanes who desecrated the temple. You remember what he did in his desecration of the holy place or the temple? Yeah, he did that, what you said. He sacrificed a pig to Zeus in the Holy of Holies of the temple of God. Nothing can be more of a, an abomination. An abomination that causes desolation is what he's going to refer to. But out of the one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. The glorious land is Israel. Uh, and there's a play on his word, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, because they would call him an, uh, Epiphanes, which means madman. And he was a madman. Now it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So who is he attacking and who is he trampling? Who are these stars? Who? Jews. Yeah. The stars of the Jews. Look at the end of Daniel for a minute. You see what they... Um, In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it said, Then those who uh, are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So he's referring to Jews who bear witness to the person of Jesus Christ, and the salvation that God has provided, that they are stars. And so this is the stars he's referring to here. He's coming against the Jews, against Israel. And he's against the, the God of Israel, casting down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of hosts. Who's that? Christ himself, the Messiah. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Uh, there was a coming period of time where there would be no regard for the God of Israel, no regard for, for God's holy word, no regard for the truth. Sounds similar today? Oh, boy. And is not truth trampled upon today? It is amazing how much falsehood, lies, deception is out there today. What, do you, what can you believe today? When things are reported to us today over the news, whether it's a, a political situation, whether it's a, a scientific medical <clears throat> statements that are being made, you, you don't know what to believe anymore because we're lied to so often now. Truth means nothing. Truth is trampled today in our day. Hmm? <clears throat> then I heard a holy one speaking. To another holy one and said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? The giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. So one angel is asking another, how long will this be? When will this take place? This abomination of desolation. Who mentioned that specifically? <laughs> The abomination of desolation. Jesus, Matthew 24. Turn there for a minute. Because yeah. Jesus is talking about this very specific incident. So it is yet future. It hasn't occurred yet. The angel wants to know, when is this going to take place? All of what we're describing here and the most important detail of chapter 8 has to do with the end times or the, the end of days, the end of the age. It's yet future. But I believe it's very near future. Jesus gave a warning. Verse 4 of chapter 24, he said, Take heed that no one deceives you. Man, there's a lot of deception going on today, isn't there? Mm. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And we see the persecution that's taking place. I thought John Michael did an excellent job in his presentation on Sunday. 
Oh, by the way, we for, I forgot to mention on Sunday, what we've agreed to do is for, between now and the end of the year, as we have done in previous years, we were taking special offerings for VOM. Well, this year, we're going to take a special offering for Alpha Ministries, for Pastor Benny. And so whatever you offer between now and December 31st, we will double. So if you offer $10, we will contribute 20 the church. Okay? So let's see what we can do in helping Brother Benny and making our offering sacrificial. Every year, this church uh, contributes 20% or more to missions. 20% or more of what we receive throughout the year is sent back out into the field. Into the, not to missions within the church, okay? Not to the pastor's radio program. Not, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of churches call it missions when it's really self-serving. No, no, no. Our missions go to missions, so I want you to know that. And we are very transparent with regard to how we handle our finances. But nonetheless, I'll make that, remind me to make that announcement again on Sunday if I forget. So between now and December 31st, whatever you give a special offering towards Alpha Ministries, we will double. Okay? Uh, where was I? Persecute you. Yes, they will. Verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. Oh, boy. There's, <laughs> is that not the truth today? Like never before. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Why is there such lawlessness today? Because the government permits it. The government no longer punishes evil. And rewards good. It does just the opposite. It's amazing. But that's why there's such lawlessness today. But he, he who endures to the end shall be saved. So we need to persevere. The perseverance of the saints has always been something that was admired by the church. And who gives you that perseverance? Who gives you that gift of hupomone? The Lord does. But you have to seek it. You have to be in his word. You have to be living in and walking with the Lord. And he'll give you the perseverance to continue. But he who endures the end shall be saved. And this, is, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Has the gospel been preached to all the nations of the world? I think pretty much saturated. You know? Oh, Billy Graham is certainly an example of that. How many have not been, how many of you have never been to the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte? Oh, we need to go. You need to go. Christmas time is a, is a wonderful time to go. I think... November the 29th, it'll be all decorated for Christmas, and I think it'll stay that way until about the 23rd of December. Uh, we'll try to plan a trip where we take a ride up there. I've been there numerous times, and every time I go to the library and I go through that exhibit, I, I'm just amazed at our God and how powerfully he used a milk farmer's son. Billy Graham was a milk farmer's son. Billy, Billy Graham was not a theologian. If, you, if you've listened to his teachings or you heard any of his... He, very simple gospel message. But how God used him in such a profound way to touch the world. When you go to the library, you're going to see a picture on the wall. There's a mural of Billy Graham in an open-air speaking engagement in Seoul, South Korea. That's the largest speaking, outdoor speaking engagement anyone has ever had the opportunity or the privilege to give. Do you know how many people were there? Yeah. It's a sea. It's a sea of people as far as you can see. 1,100,000 Koreans listening to Billy Graham. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? And, and then when the Russian army was singing the battle hymn of the Republic when he's in Moscow, I mean, just, you need to go. You need to go. But needless to say, I think the gospel has been shared throughout the world. The end is coming soon. Hmm. Verse 15 now, particular to what we're studying in Daniel. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in the winter or in the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, 
such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor nor shall ever be. And unless those days be shortened, no flesh would be left, nor be saved. For, but for the elect's sake, those days would be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Uh, I don't know if you've ever got online to, to peruse how many false messiahs are out there. This wacko in Australia, in uh, New Zealand, excuse me, who claims to be the Christ. It's amazing the number of thousands of people, gullible people who are following this man, believing he's Jesus. Multiple wives. Uh, people are so gullible that are, if you're not in the word of God, if you don't know God's truth, you can be so easily deceived. For instance, I was at a presentation last night and the speaker was talking about six times the New Testament mentions those in white robes. And he was talking about believers who are dressed in white robes. And the white robes are the righteousness of Christ. The white robe that you receive is the righteousness of Christ, okay? And he was talking about the church being in heaven. Six times white robes, the church is in heaven. Well, three of those times, those white robes are given to who? Martyrs, tribulation saints. Believers who go through the tribulation. Hmm. Beloved, you need to decide for yourself. You need to read the scriptures and know the scriptures and decide for yourself what is the rapture? What, when, why, and who? Who? There's a great deception out there today. A false belief. That you can live any way you want, claim the salvation of Christ, and be assured of the rapture. The Bible doesn't give you such insurance. Not if you're playing casually, loosely with your faith. No, 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 no. You're not saved by works. But salvation always produces good works. And I want to suggest to you that the rapture is not salvation. All Christians are saved. Well, who was this myriad of Christians from every tribe, nation, people, and tongue who go through the tribulation? and receive a white robe and martyrdom. Who are they, I suggest to you? Now, you, you decide that for yourself. Do not be deceived. Jesus warns us. This little horn represented in the near as Antiochus Epiphanes, who desecrated the temple by sacrificing a pig in the Holy of Holies, to Zeus, no less, but he's just a type, symbol, sign of the Antichrist who would be truly the one who would desecrate the temple. There's going to be a third temple. You know that, right? The Bible predicts a third temple. Where in the Bible does it predict a third temple? In the book of Ezekiel. The latter chapters of Ezekiel lays it out very clearly. And there is a group called the, the Temple Faithful who would like to build the third temple now. Every year they go and try to lay the cornerstone of the third temple. It never works out for them because it's not God's timing yet. When and how will the temple be built? When we get into chapter 9, chapter 9 of Daniel unlocks the key of all Bible prophecy. If you understand Daniel chapter 9, you'll have no problem understanding Bible prophecy and, and the history of man on this planet. But nonetheless, the Bible is very clear that it will be the Antichrist who makes a peace between Israel and her enemies, allowing the Jews to rebuild their temple. And there'll be three and a half years of peace and prosperity, supposedly. But then in the middle of that period, what happens? He, like Antiochus, he goes into the Holy of Holies of the rebuilt temple, and he proclaims himself to be God, and he, he allows a hologram or some image of him, some electronic image. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it's AI. I don't know. Uh, but nonetheless, there's an image of him that's erected in the Holy of Holies and demands that the whole world bow down and worship him that he's the God above all gods, the abomination that causes desolation, that desecrates the temple. So 
one angel said to the other, how long will this be? Verse 14, and he said to me, this is, I'm back in Daniel chapter 8. We're back in Daniel 8. Verse 14. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What was he talking about there? No? 1,260 days is three and a half years. Who, who was the first one to desecrate the temple? Who's the near? Antiochus. And he desecrated the temple. But when was the temple cleansed? Who cleansed the temple? Judas Maccabeus. Remember? Wait a minute, we're going to be celebrating that. The Jews are going to be celebrating that very soon. As we've been going through John's gospel, the last uh, thing we read was that John was celebrating the Feast of Lights, the Feast of the Maccabeans or the Feast of Hanukkah, right? And what is Hanukkah memorializing? The rededication and the cleansing of the temple. This is what he's talking about. When Antiochus sacrificed that pig there, well, 1,100 and, and uh, what is it, uh, uh, 15 days or 50 days later, uh, Judas Maccabeus cleanses the temple. That's what he's referring to there. Now, we do know that when the Antichrist stands in the Holy of Holies of the rebuilt temple, in the middle of the 70th seven of Daniel, God judges everything in sevens. I'll explain that in more detail when we get into chapter 9. We measure everything in tens. Ten years is a decade. Ten decades a century. Well, the Jews don't measure things in tens. They measure them in... And so a seven-year period is a heptad. And so God measures everything in sevens. And he said there are 70 seven-year periods in which God would be dealing directly with the Jewish people, with Israel. But we will learn later on next week that 69 of those sevens have already transpired. But there's a gap in time between the 69th seven, the end of the 69th seven, and the beginning of the 70th seven. There's a little gap in time. How long is that gap? It's been about 2,000 years. That's right. But we will see that that'll be picked up once again. But in the middle of that seven, that last final seven, is when the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies and proclaims himself to be God. And it will be that last three and a half year period where all of God's wrath is poured out upon this world. For its rejection of him. Verse 15, now it happened when I, Daniel had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So we know that the angel is Gabriel. We know that the angel previously was Gabriel as well, but he was unnamed. But here he's named. And so he came near where I stood. And he came, and I was afraid, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. When is it? What's the time of the end? The end of days. The end of the age. The end of this world as we know it. I was speaking to a woman today who was all frantic and upset about what is taking place in the world, and she can't sleep, and her, she has chest pains, and, and I said, well, do you have, are you, a, she's a Catholic. I said, well, do you have a Bible? Yes, I have a Bible. I said, well, I'll begin to read the Gospel of John. I said, you need to spend time in the Bible. It'll quiet your heart. It'll take away your fear and your anxiety. I said, read a chapter of John for the next 21 days. There's 21 chapters. Read a chapter a day, and I guarantee you after 21 days, something significant will happen. If you read it with an open mind and an open heart, and God will calm you, hmm? because he's foretold us all these things that are taking place. And, 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 you know, Catholics recite the Lord's Prayer, so we started to recite the Lord's Prayer, and then when we got to thy kingdom come, I said, my dear, that's precisely what's happening. This kingdom is dying, and it has to. His kingdom is coming. So you should be rejoicing over that. Amen? Yeah. Gabriel came, the man, understand the vision. And so he came near where I stood, verse 17 now, of chapter 8 of Daniel, verse 17. And so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. And he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep. I think he fainted <laughs> with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. Wake up, Daniel, wake up. Come on, don't be afraid. 
And he said, look, now I think if an angel appeared to any of us tonight, we'd all be afraid, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. No, a- a- angels are, are nothing to make light of. If, if you had an angel stand before you tonight, you'd either pass out or we'd have to change your pants. You know. But he touched me and I stood upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time. When? The end of the days. Now. That's right, Pat. Now. Right now. The time in which we live. The latter time of the indignation. Whose indignation? What indignation? The Lord's indignation. The Lord's wrath. Hmm. Come out, my people. Enter your chambers. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Who wrote that? Isaiah. And then he said, what indignation? Whose indignation? And he told us it's the Lord's indignation. For the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Hmm. For, look, for I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. God's determined an end to this age. Aren't you glad? Yes, yes. Now he gives the interpretation. Verse 20. The ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Medea and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king, that's Alexander. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, the four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. It didn't have the same power and influence and control that Alexander did. It was a divided power because you know you have four generals four leaders i mean uh, house divided will not no verse 23 in the latter time of their kingdom the transgressors have reached their fullness a king will arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes i mean the, the, the countenance of his face just looking at him it'll be fearful Just looking at him, he he gives a full expression of evil. Frightful. There's no no love, no peace, no joy radiating from this man's face at all. You know, you don't have to be able to speak someone else's language in order to communicate love, do you? They can see it in your eyes. Well, you don't have to be able to speak someone's language to communicate hatred, malice. Malice. Evil, do you? No, no. And so this man fears features who understands sinister schemes. I mean, he's got the mind of the devil. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own. Well, why is that? Well, we read about him previously, this little horn. Go to Revelation 13 for a minute. This is the beast that rises up out of the sea, the Antichrist. We'll see that the Antichrist is described with the four beasts that were in chapter 7 that Daniel saw. Chapter 13, verse 1 of Revelation. Revelation 13, 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his, ten, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Who represented the leopard? Greece. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Who was the bear? Medo-Persia. His mouth was like the mouth of the lion. Who was the lion? Babylon. All of the power, all of the control, all of the first of all the previous empires. And the dragon. Who was the dragon? And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So when when Daniel writes here, and the angel describes him in the vision, that, that in verse 24, Daniel 8, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He's under the power of Satan. This man is fully possessed by the spirit of Satan. It's Satan incarnate. Just as Jesus was God incarnate, God in the flesh, this man is Satan in the flesh. And just one look at him and you will know. It just He permeates evil. He telegraphs evil. He shall destroy fearfully or, or with extraordinary power in the way he destroys people and lives and other nations. He shall prosper and thrive. 
And you say, how is it that the wicked are so successful? Why is it the wicked are so prosperous? We ask ourselves that today, don't we? Such wicked men and women who are so successful, prospering, seem to have everything that you can imagine in this life. But until you consider the end of the matter, just like with this man, this man will make Putin look like a Boy Scout. He is so evil. Now, if you understand Putin, Putin's a thug. He's, Putin's very evil. But he has nothing in comparison to this man. And he shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. He's, he's going to gain control over God's people. Uh, I quoted from Romans 8 on Sunday morning after John's, John Michael's presentation. Do you remember what I quoted? I'm sorry? Yeah, what did I quote? Well, before that. We shall be like lambs led to the slaughter. As Jesus was the sacrifice for the salvation of the world. And in a strange way, Israel was sacrificed for our salvation as well, weren't they? In a stranger way, we the church will be sacrificed for the glory of God and it will be for the salvation of some. But the Antichrist is going to gain control and overpower the Christians and the Jews that are here during that time. The body of Christ is going to be raptured. But there will be Christians here that were not raptured who Satan will overcome through the Antichrist. There will be Jews that God is going to awaken to the truth of who Jesus is, the Messiah, who the Antichrist is going to overpower them. Through his cunning, verse 25 of chapter 8 of Daniel, through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand. Go, Brandon. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I mean, come on, is it, you know. I, I never thought I would long for an administration like Bill Clinton's once again. But I would welcome Bill Clinton. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. He's so arrogant and so uh, narcissistic, so egotistical. I mean, this man's ego is completely out of control. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. Who's that? Jesus, he's going, to, he's going to speak blasphemous against the Lord, and it's going to seem like he's getting away with it, like, like this man has more power than God. How many people erroneously believe that Satan is equal in power to God? How ridiculous is that? The devil is whose devil? Who created him? And God can destroy him, right? The devil has no power but what God allows him to have. You understand that? And the only thing the devil can tempt you with is what you want. He can't tempt you with what you don't want. He tempts you with what you want. So you have, to, you have to ask God to take away any sinful or inappropriate desire from your heart, and you can't be tempted. Right? You can't tempt me with mint chocolate ice cream. I can't stand it. It's an abomination. <laughs> to mi no, to mix mint and chocolate? I mean, it's just, you know, people are sick. Now, Rum raisin? Rum raisin, that's another matter, okay? Some of you don't like rum raisin, right? Oh, you don't know. It's not a chatter. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human hands. Who's going to destroy him? Jesus, yes, praise the Lord. He will have his end, just as that empire will have its end, but not by a man, not by another empire, but by God himself establishing his kingdom. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. 
Oh, yeah, this is the time that he talked about where time, times, and half a time in chapter 7, three and a half years, that last three and a half years of human history where the whole world is in opposition to God. When, when Jesus Christ even reveals himself, they are going to blaspheme him. Ask that they can be hidden under the rocks. They'd rather be stoned than surrender to Jesus Christ. That's the hardness of man's heart. But look at Daniel's response. If we looked at Daniel's response at the end of chapter 7, verse 28, he said, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. My countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Now, it, it was a number of years before he would actually write about this, what he saw in his vision, and it troubled him. And then he gets, two years later, he gets this further vision, and this even bothered him the more so because he sees evil triumphing over his people destroying them, slaughtering them, making the holocaust that, that the Nazis committed to be nothing in comparison. The worst is yet to come for the Jewish people. You understand that? Two-thirds of the Jewish people will be destroyed. If that were to happen today, how many would that be? 10 million? Yeah. But look, look at verse 27 now. And I, Daniel, fainted. I, I passed out from what I saw. I was sick for days. After I arose and went about the king's business, but I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Now, he'll tell us at the end of his writing in chapter 12 that all of this gave him a divine headache. He couldn't understand it, any of it, really. He couldn't put it all together. Isn't it amazing? You and I can understand the prophecies of Daniel better than Daniel did at the time. Because, you know, it's, it's in the past, right? But it becomes very clear to us. But Daniel said, I've got a divine headache. But what, what did the angel say to him in chapter 12 as he says this? Verse 9, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. But you, verse 13, go your way to the end, for you will, shall rest and will arise in your inheritance at the end of the days. It's not for you to understand, Daniel, but isn't it amazing? Listen to me. Never before in the history of the church have we been clearly able to understand and interpret Bible prophecy, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, etc., more accurately than we can right now. Right now. But the interesting part about that, the enigma, is that never before has there been more of, an, a, 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 a purposed avoidance of Bible prophecy than ever before. Most churches won't teach on Bible prophecy. They won't teach the Old Testament. They don't want to teach about end times and the judgment that's coming. It doesn't draw the crowd. But as I pointed out on Sunday morning, every minister has a responsibility, particularly in our day, is to prepare the flock emotionally, mentally, spiritually for what's coming. And if you don't prepare people, they're, they're, they're going to be shocked. It's going to take the wind out of their sails. It's going to cause them to possibly fa suffer shipwreck because they don't understand the things that God would allow to come about and to take place. Does God not have the right to allow a suffering if it glorifies him into our lives? Sure he does. So Daniel was sickened by all that he saw, but he didn't realize that it would all be for the glory of God. Evil, Satan, the Antichrist. God permissibly allows them to exist for his glory. His glory will be demonstrated when he finally judges evil. Evil believes it succeeds erroneously, in the short term because it can conquer over good in the short term. But in the long term, will justice prevail? Oh, yeah. Yeah, when he comes, he will execute justice on the earth. Praise God. Now, I never ask for justice. Do you? No. What do you ask for? Mercy. Mercy, <laughs> mercy Lord. So that, that you're either you're going to receive his mercy because you've surrendered to him or you receive his justice because you have not. Any questions or comments? Next week when we get into chapter 9, you're going to love chapter 9. I love Daniel 9. 
It explains everything. Yeah. Shall we stand? Terry, you got a closing song?